And what I've noticed is in the Bible, I can give you example after example after example where people had to get out of a comfort zone to get Jesus to stand still. And what I'm trying to promote in this building is an atmosphere of liberty because everybody's not at the same place. And let me tell you something, God forbids anything to have total control over you except the Holy Spirit of God. So some of you today that say, I've just lost my drive and lost my passion, I invite you to get in the Word of God and let God paint a picture on the inside out of you where your tomorrow's so great it'll make you walk out of the doldrums of your past. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Okay, Jesus is in a crowd of people. The word thronged mean consider somebody trying to make their way through paparazzi and their celebrity. Uh, they're being buff buffeted by everybody, 360 degrees. So people were all around him. Now, a certain woman that had a flow of blood, the actual real word right there is not flow, it's called issue of blood. For 12 years, that means she was hemorrhaging, she was bleeding and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all she had and was no better. Actually, she grew worse. <clears throat> when she heard about Jesus, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When she heard, she got faith when she heard. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Next verse. Immediately, the issue of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body she was healed of the affliction. Verse 30. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around and said, who touched my clothes? The disciples said, are you kidding me? Everybody's touching you. You're in a crowd. You're cleaning out hospitals. You're casting out devils. You're raising the dead. You're feeding 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. Everybody's trying to get to you. What do you mean who touched you? He looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Catch this. He did not say my power has healed you. Your faith has healed you. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name and everybody said amen. Yeah, let's go ahead and clap right there. I like it when you clap and it ain't even preached yet. That's a good day. As, as I was reading this scripture and thinking about how to preach to you about the prayer of faith, I just, I couldn't think of any better story to break down, to my, try to help you grab and grasp this truth than the one with the woman with the issue of blood. I, I think it's sad. This, this woman has been known forever all throughout millenniums since the Bible was written in the first century church. She's been known as the woman with the issue of blood. How sad is it that we've always lived in a society that knows us by our issue? This woman don't even have a name. Everybody just knows her issue. <laughs> you better watch who you let know your issues. Okay. Bible talks about Naaman in the Bible and it gives all these great descriptions and it says, comma, but he was a leper. All, I mean... Many victories. God had brought him many victories to his count. He was a military commander. He said, but he was a leper. You better be careful who you show your butt to. Because <laughs> there's people, if they find out your flaw, your character problem, your mistake, your past, they will begin to define you by your issue. And you got to understand Jesus never saw the issue. 
He didn't care about the issue, but people will try to define you by the issue. And this woman is even written about by God's writers is the woman with the issue of blood. That was her name. That's how they defined her. That's what they go. She was known for the fact that for 12 years, blood had been hemorrhaging from her body. Uh, most theologians think this was a female type hemorrhage that she was experiencing. And let me tell you something. The Bible said 12 years. I've got to point out a few things before I crank down on the prayer. The number 12 in the Bible is the number of government and rulership. I think it's significant that the writer wanted to tell you how long she's dealt with this. Because it now is dictating every area. This thing rules her life. She cannot make a decision outside of her issue. Her issue is the guiding factor in where she goes, where she does not go. It's the guiding factor in her economy, and now her economy is gone. It is the guiding factor in how weak her body is, what she's able to do, what she's not able to do, what, what activities she can involve herself in. It now has total and com complete control of her life. And let me tell you something. God forbids anything to have total control over you except the Holy Spirit of God. And so whatever has total control of you, whether it is a medication, come on somebody, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a perversion, whether it's something twisted, God is here to break that thing today because the only thing God wants ruling you is when his Holy Spirit gets on the inside of you and you begin to walk in the Spirit, you begin to live in the Spirit, and anything else enslaving you, God forbids it because he breaks the chains of slavery and he breaks the chains of rulership over your life. This woman has not just had it, but had it 12 years until now. It is the deciding factor in everything in her life. The next thing, I, this stuff I had to point out, this, is a, this, this scripture right here is a preacher's heaven. The next thing, and I'm going to get ready to light you up here the next three or four minutes. We're going to get crazy in here. Tell your neighbor, say, loosen up a little bit. Hallelujah. <laughs> that church where you couldn't say amen and be crazy, this is not that church. We are people that are actually excited that we're saved here at this church. Amen. <laughs> she did not have Jesus' attention. Not only did she not have Jesus' attention, she had to come from behind. That means Jesus is moving away from her. <laughs> she was not in his line of sight. She was not his focus. She had to get his attention. What you've got to understand is she was being, he was being thronged by everybody, but everybody didn't get something. She's the only one we know about in that crowd that got power. Okay, there's over a thousand people in this building now. Not everybody's touching in the same way. And what I've noticed is in the Bible, I can give you example after example after example where people had to get out of a comfort zone to get Jesus to stand still. And what I'm trying to promote in this building is an atmosphere of liberty because everybody's not at the same place. And there might be a Sunday where things are really good in your life and you just come and you worship God and you give him praise and you give him glory. But there's some other people, they are fighting. They're in a struggle and they need a breakthrough and they know that the clock is ticking and they know that they don't have a much of a window of opportunity and they need to have the liberty without being judged to get out in an aisle and begin to dance before God and begin to spin before God. Why? Because they understand I'm in church and Jesus is here and I need my issue stopped today. So I want you to know in this building, even if you need to take a second right here, if you're in something that only God can fix, you need to open your mouth, wave your hands and get his attention. Don't you sit there and let him pass you by. Do whatever you got to do to get Jesus to stop and turn around who touched me? Good God, I feel something happening in this place. Somebody take five seconds and give him some glory. Shout like you've never shouted. Clap like you've never clapped. If you got to, just jump on me. I don't care what you got to do. But don't leave here with your issue when Jesus is in the house. Blind bar. Blind from birth, 
His issue ruled his life. His issue ruled his economy. It had reduced him to a beggar. He heard that Jesus was coming. He started screaming. We throw people out of church if they scream. He started screaming. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What did everybody around them do? All the church people started going, shh, shh. The Bible said he got louder. Jesus, thou son of David. See, you got to understand when it's your moment and step out into your moment and not let this moment pass you by. This is your door of opportunity. And when Jesus is coming, Jesus don't stop for people who are acting normal. Jesus is stopping for people that are willing to get out of their comfort zone and act foolish for just a minute. Somebody shout hallelujah. God is doing something in this place. Hey! I got the clip. How many have ever made this statement? If I knew back then what I know now, if I would have known then what I know now, I'd have never been in this position. So wisdom, the Bible says, is the principal thing. That's our problem in the church. We want Jesus to have his way as long as it looks the way I want it to look. The kingdom is his. However he wants to move, we're going to let him move. We're going to manifest in the next months with blessings that are coming good measure first don't shake it together he's on his way it's on his way i'm gonna tell you for every time the devil got through there were more times he couldn't get through because of a hedge of protection that was around you the addiction is broken you ain't gotta go to any 12 step anything where where are the days when there's a move of god like that there's a higher level to live there's a greater place to walk. Come on down. How great is our God? He sent his word and healed us. Now he wants it returned unto him. So the prayer of faith goes back and says, Lord, I thank you that by your stripes I am healed and healing is the children's bread. The prayer of faith does not ask God. It already knows what God wants to do. This series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we'll include free shipping and an MP3 download card or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. Don't go anywhere. We're going to get back to that word in just a moment. I want to just break right here for just a second, and I want to ask you, uh, would you consider something? I am always so grateful to all of our wonderful covenant partners and maybe people who aren't covenant partners, but you give occasionally, some of you frequently, some of you uh, whenever there's that ability. But I want you to notice we didn't sell any ads and we didn't have any sponsors and we didn't have any commercials because we believe the gospel of Jesus that the people of God are so passionate about his message going forth, the message of salvation and the message of his kingdom, the way we can live an abundant life is the most important thing in the earth. And we believe that with such a deep passion that we give and we give sacrificially. Would you consider those of you who have been given your continued faithful giving, those of you who maybe occasionally would you become a consistent giver? Maybe those of you who've been blessed but never given before, maybe for the first time, becoming a monthly covenant partner or just a one-time gift. But we want to do everything we can to stay on the air and represent Jesus Christ in a very powerful and a very excellent way. We have a great team of people right here who are just as passionate about it as I am. And with you, the viewers, helping us do what we do, there's no end to how many people we can reach. We're in the greatest days ever of seeing more people saved than we ever have before. Would you help me go further? Give now. <laughs> Malachi 4, verse 2. <laughs> Malachi 3 is where the tithing and offering verse is. That's the first one preachers learn when they get to Bible college, the tithing scripture. But Malachi does say other things. And 400 years before Jesus, Malachi says this. He said, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go up, go out and grow fat like the stall fed calf. In other words, he said, a Messiah is coming. There'll be healing in his wings. And when he comes and when he meets you, you'll not lack for anything. <clears throat> if I took you to Matthew 9, which I don't have time 
it's another account of the same story. And many writers, when they are watching something, they write, you know, their angle, what they saw. Matthew picked up on something else. Matthew said, not that she touched his clothes, but she touched the hem. That word hem in the Greek means wings. On a Hebrew garment, especially a priest, the wings were the tassels. The son of righteousness will arise, and when he comes, he will have healing in his tassels. She pressed through the crowd and reached out and touched the tassel. Because she had already heard that Malachi said, this Messiah, when he shows up, he's going to walk in such power that if you just touch things dangling from his garment, there's healing in them. So what did she do? The word that she had heard. Ah, let me get into this. The word of God, we're talking about the perfect, is supposed to paint pictures on the canvas of your faith. So you may be in a place where you can't rub two quarters together and buy a Coke, but you know God has called you blessed. If you can't see that here, you're going to have to let God paint a picture here. <clears throat> Pardon me. He has to paint a picture on the canvas of your faith. That's what the word does. It creates an image. So if you're sick, can you see yourself healed? If you're broke, can you see yourself blessed? If you're by yourself, can you see your family put back together? That's, that's, that you've got to be able to see it. And the Bible says that she said within herself. So she heard and then she talked to herself. When you are believing in faith, God doesn't need anybody else's permission to answer your prayer. <laughs> Some of you need to know you're not automatically going to get support for everything that you believe in God to do. In fact, we live in a generation we got more haters than we got supporters. And there might be people hating on you because once you say, I'm no longer satisfied with where I am, I believe God has something better than everybody you left on that last level. You used to be with them, but now they start taking practice and take throwing darts at you. Why? Because you moving forward is an indictment against their laziness. <laughs> I am preaching. So she had a picture within herself and she talked to herself. The art of talking to yourself. Do you know how many times after COVID when this church lost 80% of its volunteer base and had about 20% of its attendance restored? Do you not have any idea how many times I had to talk to myself? When I came in here and saw a building that's that 3,500 and there was 350 people in it, you know what I do? I smile at you and then I go home and talk. I go home and talk to myself. Why? There ain't nobody else calling me talking to me. I don't have any encouragement committee. So I have to look in the mirror and encourage myself in the Lord. I have to look in the mirror and say, God, you brought redemption here because you want a revival for this area. And whether we came off COVID or not, it does not matter. You will do what you said you will do. And looking not at the things which are seen, I tend to focus on the things which you've written in my spirit. Tell your neighbor, sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Uh. And then after she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, that gave her the power to do. Remember, anybody who's lost blood, she's in a weakened condition. And he's filled, he's surrounded by a crowd. 
So in a weakened condition, she's got to push everybody out of the way. What gave her the power to do that? What she saw. People who have no passion and no desire to pursue anything don't see anything. Because if you see something on the inside of you, that gives you the passion to pursue it. And when you keep that picture on the inside of you and you focus on it, nothing will stop your desire and your passion to pursue it. So some of you today that say, I've just lost my drive and lost my passion, I invite you to get in the Word of God and let God paint a picture on the inside of you where your tomorrow is so great it'll make you walk out of the doldrums of your past. I'm going somewhere. The prayer of faith. i got to finish up. Ah, time's getting away from me. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Then I'll end at Matthew 9. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Evidence is courtroom language. Faith is evidence. What will evidence do in a court? Get you convicted. Faith is the evidence of what you see inside of you. In other words, if you just can't muster up the faith for it, that may mean it's not yours. But the fact that you can believe for it means it's yours. I can believe for revival in the Bay Area. That means I have the evidence that it is already mine and it's already done. <laughs> so no matter what comes in front of my eyes, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking right here at what God said. All right? So this is the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith is this. It's not the prayer of suggestion. It's not the prayer of would you. It's not the prayer of if it's your will. It's not the prayer of might and maybe. The prayer of faith already knows what God says. The woman with the issue already knew that whenever this Messiah comes, he's got healing in his tassels. That's settled. So when the opportunity afforded itself, she didn't even ask. She just acted. Because why do you have to ask for what God says already is? The Bible says she came to him fearful and trembling. And I thought, why does she do that? It's not like, Jesus had a reputation for being ugly to people. She did that because she knew she had gotten something she didn't ask for. Jesus didn't care if she had asked. Why? He knew she had, he had been touched with faith. And there's a difference between touching him and touching him with faith. We've got to come in this building and have faith that makes a demand on it. Her faith made a demand. And he turned around. He felt the demand. He turned around and said, who did that? Everybody's touching, but only one got something. I don't want to be like the crowd. I want to be like the woman. I want everybody to come in this room. I want us to be the church where people go if they know they can get something from God. Because we have an atmosphere where we touch him in his wings and the son of righteousness comes and heals his people. Let me tell you. So doubt cannot be a part of this prayer. It's very hard to get people corporately to do anything. It's very difficult. That's my job is to preach a corporate blessing, a corporate message. Even the Bible, the Bible wants to, I mean, people want to call it a cult, but the Bible says, I wish that you all would speak the same things. I wish that you all would think the same. I wish you Oh, would get what I'm saying and get what I'm thinking and put it in your mouth and march in the same direction. Yes. <clears throat> but it's hard to get people to corporately pray. It's hard to get people to corporately give. It's hard to get people to corporately. And when you have, when we call people up here who are sick, you can go ahead and play, Terrence. I got to land this plane. When we call people up here who are sick, they, there's no room for doubters. If somebody coming up here and they got a tumor and the doctor says it's inoperable, do you know what that means? Their only option is God. And the prayer of faith will save them. 
But this is not the prayer of faith when we got elders up here praying for people and you on the back row, you know my grandma died with that. Oh, I see people go up there all the time. I don't really believe nothing's going to happen. And if that's in the room, let me show you how it affects things. Matthew 9, go to the next scripture. When Jesus, okay, verse 22, the woman's healed. Go in peace. Next verse. When Jesus, no, no, I'm sorry. You go back last one. I'm talking to the people next verse. There we go. When Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw the flute players, the noisy crowd wailing. Somebody just died. He said to them, make room for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. Next verse. When he put the crowd outside. The sweet little Jesus who would never offend anybody who your grandmama has on the wall holding a lamb. He went into a room full of pessimists knowing that somebody was sick and going to die. And everybody that was ridiculing, wailing, and doubting, and they were a naysayer, get them out of the room. Because the Bible says you have to believe in your heart and do not doubt. And then you will have those things which you say. I want to take a moment before you get off the air because I think it would be tragic uh, for you to have stayed with me these last few minutes and given me uh, this much of your time and me not have a chance to lead you to Jesus. Whether you're deficient, whether you're depleted, whether life is pretty good or whether life is tragic, everybody needs a savior. Everybody has that void deep down the inside that success, significance, money, nothing else will satisfy. Only Jesus can satisfy the longings of the heart. And I wanna offer you Jesus today. It's this simple, would you pray with me? It goes like this. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose on the third day so I could be saved. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Make my heart your home. I receive your gift of salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. And just like that, You've been saved. You've been born again. Now you got to let us know. So write in, call, do whatever you have to. We want to know what God has done in your life. How many have ever made this statement? If I knew back then what I know now. If I would have known then what I know now, I'd have never been in this position. So wisdom, the Bible says, is the principal thing. That's our problem in the church. We want Jesus to have his way as long as it looks the way I want it to look. The kingdom is his. However he wants to move, we're going to let him move. You are going to manifest in the next few months where blessings that are coming, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. is on. On his way, it's on his way. I want to tell you for every time the devil got through, there were more times he couldn't get through because of a hedge of protection that was around you. The addiction is broken. You ain't got to go to any 12-step anything. Where, where are the days where there's a move of God like that? There's a higher level to live. There's a greater place to walk. Come on now.